I'm very happy to be here and talking with you uh, about data journalism. Okay, so my name is Bahare Heravi, and I run um, Hacks Hackers uh, Dublin in Ireland. Um, a little bit of an, an introduction about myself. I am a lecturer in information and communication studies at the uh, University College uh, Dublin and a research group leader, leader at the Insight News Lab in the National University of Ireland in Galway. I also teach data journalism at the Dublin City University. I'm a former um, lead data scientist at the Irish Times where I um, co-founded the Irish Times data. Okay, so that's about me. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, data journalism here. Um, what data journalism is, what process do we need to take for performing a data journalism project from beginning to an end. I'm going to present you with some examples of data journalism and some tools to be able to perform um, the work in each step that I'm going to mention. Uh, you, a lot of slides are going to flash in front of your eyes, so there's so many things going quite fast. Uh, and the whole point is you're just going to be introduced to so many tools. I'm not going to go in details of any of the tools that you're going to see, um, so don't mind that. What is Hacks Hackers Dublin? How many people here are familiar with Hacks Hackers? Okay, most people. So Hacks Hackers is an international grassroots kind of journal journalism techie kind of um, type organization which tries to bring together journalists and techie people um, so that they could kind of invent the future of news or invent the future of journalism in a way. But the main point is they come together to try to solve interesting problems that the journalists themselves on their own cannot do or that people who are in tech or information and data science on their own won't be able to do. Okay, so we start with the definition of data journalism. Can somebody in the audience give me a definition of data journalism? Maybe just shout, what do you think data journalism is? Nothing? How many of you are familiar with data journalism, one way or another? How many of you would think you would like to run data journalism projects in the future? Okay, so what data journalism is, you, you're going to find different definitions in different books and presentations. Um, here I'm going to use a very simple um, definition of data journalism, which is telling stories with data or telling journalistic stories with data and as journalists you would know what journalistic mean uh, means so I'm not going to explain what that is and uh, when you're talking about data journalism normally data is the source of your work or the source of your investigation okay so I am assuming most people here know what journalism is but what is data um, do we know the difference between data and information, for example? There is so much data available out there these days. That is one of the reasons that data journalism has become popular recently. Uh, it is not a new thing necessarily. It had existed from so many years ago. But now just because we have access to so much more data, data journalism has become more popular. But what is data? Here I have a diagram which is called the Diagram of Data, Information, Knowledge, and Wisdom. Uh, here, I don't know if you could see exactly. Here, the lowest level is data. So when you're talking about discrete, discrete elements, like facts, symbols, raw elements, raw data, we are talking about data. Data on its own doesn't have much meaning. It's just a small piece or a big piece of information with no relationship to any other piece of data uh, or any context. When we add some um, relations or relationships between our different pieces of data, then we have information. Um, as journalists, you are familiar with these questions of who, what, when, and where. So when we ask the questions of who, what, when, and where, we have come one level higher from data to information. Then when we ask the question of how, when we find some patterns between the information that we have got at this moment or at this level, uh, then we have knowledge. 
We are at the level of knowledge. And when we understand the principles between or within our knowledge, then we have wisdom. So in, today we are not going to talk much about wisdom, but I'm going to put it next to the five W. Yeah. Can you read about the, or the... Oh, yeah, the, yeah, this is data. This is information. This is knowledge. And this one on the top is wisdom. So I'm going to put this next to the five W's and one H of journalism, or in many cases, information gathering. Uh, journalists are very much familiar with these questions. And when you work on journalism stories or on your stories, you normally you often go and ask a number of these questions. So as you could see, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, almost all of these five W's and one H, uh, we could find it in our um, data information, knowledge, wisdom, uh, paradigm. So what is the role of data journalism, really? The role of data journalism is to go and ask these questions, find a relationship, add some context maybe into it, find the patterns, tell us why and how it happened. So basically, the role of the data journalist is to lift data from the data level to as high level as possible or as their story uh, needs. OK. So data journalism has its root in computer-assisted reporting, which kind of was mostly started in 1960 uh, or 1960s. Um, here I have a couple of examples of old data journalism. Uh, how many of you have seen this diagram? So a few of you have seen this diagram. This is called Napoleon's March on Moscow. So the story is that a troop Napo from Napoleon's troop uh, start going towards Moscow for whatever war it was. Uh, the beige color here, if you could see clearly, is the number of uh, soldiers who started this journey, right? And then as they move on, the number kind of drops. And then the black color is the color of soldiers who came back. And as you could see, in different places, the, peop the soldiers have gone to on different missions, perhaps, or to different locations. There's six different factors that this um, diagram um, kind of presents. Here we're going to talk about mostly about the number of soldiers. And as we can see, a lot of people left, and then not really so many people came back. So this was one of the early examples of data journalism that different factors uh, were recorded and then were presented um, to the audience or to whoever was seeing this diagram. Another famous example is Florence Nightingale's Coxcomb diagram. How many of you have seen this? How many of you are familiar with Florence Nightingale? You know her as a nurse, I suppose. Uh, so she was a nurse who was working during this specific war, um, the army in the west, in the east, sorry, it was called, in 1858. So she was a nurse, and she wanted to go and help the soldiers uh, on, when they were, on, they were fighting, basically, because she believed that most of the soldiers are actually not dying from, from the war itself, but from hygiene size of the war, because it was not hygienic, because most of the soldiers were moved to a hospital in Turkey, and at that time, that hospital was not very hygienic for some reason, or they didn't have enough... Um, maybe doctors uh, to attend to the soldiers. So she wanted to go and help, and in the beginning, she was not allowed to. Uh, and then she started gathering the information around this specific story and recording the number of people who died because of war and the war wound, which is this, these two colors, and the rest of the people who, or the soldiers who died from other reasons. Uh, and at some point, she presented this data or this information to the authorities to show them that if you send nurses um, to help the soldiers, we are going to have much, much less casualty. And at this point, finally, uh, the authorities decided that, okay, uh, we see what you're talking about. We are going to send more nurses, or we are going to send nurses to this specific hospital to help the soldiers. And then the number of casualties comes down significantly. So these are two examples, two kind of classic examples of, uh, in a sense, data journalism, which was happening uh, in 80. 1856 in this case, and 1812 um, in this other case. OK, so now we move on from past to the future. Who knows C uh, Tim Berners-Lee? 
Who doesn't know Tim, so, who doesn't know Tim Berners-Lee in the room? Um, so if you don't know him, he's the founder of the World Wide Web, or the web uh, as we use it. And in the Data Journalism Handbook, he has said that data journalism is the future. Um, he hasn't clarified future of what, but I'm assuming he means future of journalism. I don't think it's the future of everything and everywhere. So here is a little bit of text that I'm not going to read, uh, but the gist of it is that journalists in the future, all of them will need to have data skills and they all need to be data savvy to be able to survive in this competitive uh, environment. You can go and uh, if you want it, you can find it on uh, Data Journalism Handbook. Okay, so now we want to move to the process of data journalism to see how we can uh, run a data journalism project. Um, again, you're going to see slightly different uh, processes in different books or in different articles. This is what I normally use for uh, training purposes. When you start a data journalism project, like many other journalistic projects or any other projects, uh, as a matter of fact, you start normally with an idea. You have an idea that you are passionate about or you're interested in, in, and you want to tell a story about that idea. I said in most cases, because this is not the case always, uh, in some cases in the data desks or data rooms, uh, um, because you want to publish, you're also looking for new data sets. So you sometimes have data calendars set for yourself. And you know that um, next week on Tuesday, um, the housing price index comes out. So you may not necessarily have this brilliant idea uh, that you want to write about housing prices, but because you know that a data set is coming out in this specific date, uh, you plan around that specific data set that is coming out to tell a story for that. So it's kind of a, two types of starting a data journalism project. Uh, next step, almost always, unless you start with the data, is finding and collecting the data. Um, if you don't start off with the data and you've, if you start with your idea, it may not be super easy to find the data that you want to support your story or you want to uh, crunch uh, to be able to find an interesting story out of. So your first level or first step is to find the data and to collect the data. And again, finding and collecting the data could be slightly different because you might find the data in paper form or scan of paper forms, like in JPEG, or you might find the data in PDF, but you may not necessarily be able to process it. So collecting the data could be slightly different than finding the data. I'm going to go through all of these steps in more details later on, and then I'm going to introduce a number of techniques and tools for, of, uh, for each of these. The second step, normally, in most cases, is cleaning and fixing the data. If you talk to the data journalists and ask them how much of your time is spent on actually telling the story uh, or even creating that visualization and how many of it is spent on analyzing and cleaning the data, uh, normally, or in most cases, they say um, 20 to 30 percent of my time is spent on actually telling and creating the story, and 70 to 80 percent of my time was on other things, finding the data, cleaning and the, the data, and, and analyzing the data. So data cleaning could, it's a dirty work, and it could actually take a lot of time. So the next step is analyzing and summarizing the data. You found two data sets that you're interested in. You want to see if there is any correlation between road casualties and the number of penalty points that the police, the traffic police has given to the drivers. Two different data sets, maybe from two different sources. You want to put them together, either summarize them or maybe run some statistics analysis and find if there is any correlation between two, two data sets or three data sets that you have. Uh, you also might to decide, as journalists, go out and interview some people to support your story. For example, some authorities, maybe. After you analyze and summarize your data, it's time to communicate your data. So you go, you want, you, you, you just, you basically go to the step of visualizing your data. Uh, it could, the visualization could take many, many forms. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about some of these forms today. Some of them I will not be able to talk about. And then the last step is writing the story, which is part of the communicating the story. 
Okay, so I'm going to show you a number of examples of data journalism uh, websites and a small number of data journalism uh, examples. And then I'm going to a little bit more detail. All right. So um, if you're interested in data journalism, you probably have heard of The Guardian. The Guardian was really the, the, the first uh, news organization who started uh, organized crime, organized data journalism um, with their data blog. And then they were, uh, Simon Rogers was quite open about the process that they were taking, which was very helpful for other organizations uh, to pick up on their experience and their learnings and apply to their own work. So the Guardian is really um, normally one of the kind of father of data journalism in the newsrooms in a way. Um, Financial Times data also has interesting work. The only problem is that in most cases they are uh, behind the paywall, so you may not be able to see it. Um, the Irish Times data that I uh, helped uh, start uh, also has a lot of data stories on Irish, in, in, in an Irish context. Uh, um, so if you're interested in Ireland or stories related to Ireland, you could go and um, check Irish Times data. RTE also is the Irish TV and uh, radio uh, organization, broadcaster. They also have just started recently an RTE investigations unit, which they bring a lot of data elements into their story. The New York Times has a lot of um, data stories and a data desk. If you're interested, search for uh, 2005 in visual stories and graphics, and it will give you a kind of summary of all the uh, data journalism stories or graphics and interactive stories that they have done. It's a pretty good place to start. Uh, same is the Wall Street Journal. They have their own data team and graphics and interactive teams. They, these names are normally used in different ways in different organizations. Some of them have graphics team, interactive team. Uh, most of them, have a core data team, but some have separate visual or interactive team. Again, for them, they have their interactive graphics in the year. If you're interested, go and just search for their 2015 and see their last year's stories. Same story with Chicago Tribune, um, graphics team, a lot of data stories there. Okay, so data stories could take many forms. It could be from um, social uh, concepts or stories, like this one from The Guardian, which is about the LGBT rights around the world. And um, uh, I'm not sure, let's see if I can show it to you. <coughs> okay, so for example, this one, um, it hasn't loaded completely. Each of these are countries, it's not loading it. Okay, if you go on any of these, it will show you what exact rights uh, LGBT people have in each country and in each um, continent. Other examples are, this one was a football match, as simple as a football match between Ireland and Scotland. And it was a um, kind of uh, data visualization of um, people who were tweeting during the match to see what happens when the referee gives a yellow card or what happens when there is a, there's a goal. Um, the internet is pretty slow. So this is Ireland and Scotland and the UK. Uh, if we just wait and sit, sit and wait and see when we get close to the goal, both of the countries, for example, kind of light up. So it could be as simple as these sort of stories. It doesn't mean that creation of this story was super simple, and, but the story itself is simple. Another very, very simple story, which is very interesting, was this one. Um, baby name stories. Uh, you might think it is kind of ridiculous, but this was the top story of not only the data block, but the whole of Irish Times for a whole year, almost a whole year. This was between one and second story. And it was just about so a bunch of charts showing people that what name is the most popular in 2015, 2014, 2013, and you could go and check. And some people started um, 
coming up with their own stories. For example, saying in, I don't know, year 2013, there was this edition of the Star Wars, and for that reason, so many people chose X and Y names, and that's why these specific names became popular. Uh, so again, it could be very, very simple, but appeals to a lot of people because everybody has a name. Uh, this is another example of data journalism story, which comes from an academic research, which was the research itself was the study of Irish journalists in how much they use social media. But then the visualization of it become, became interesting, not only for the academic community, but also for the wider public. So maybe I just mentioned some of the tools. Here the tool is Car2DB, and here the tool is um, Infogram. I'm going to mention them later again. OK, so the point here is anybody can do it. To be a data journalist, you don't have to be a programmer. Um, one thing that perhaps, one bad thing that programmers and software engineers have done in this world, including myself, I am one, so I can say my background is software engineering. Uh, in a sense, a lot, a lot of people now feel that if they don't know how to code, it means they can't do a lot of things. That is not true, because the role of those programmers should be, including myself, instead of making people feel like that you're not clever enough you ca or you can't do things, if you can't work with the command line, for example, or if you can't write a, 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 co a line of Python or R, instead, software engineers should try to create new tools for people who are not software engineers, who are not supposed to code, but they have other things in their lives to do in, uh, except, uh, instead of coding. So that is also happening, and that's why anybody can do it. Anybody who knows a little bit about journalism or who's a journalist could also be a data journalist. And there's a lot of tools for that. I'm going to show those a lot of tools. Maybe you could take photos of them and go and explore them later uh, at home or at work. Um, but to show them uh, th these tools, I first uh, talk about the types of data analysis or the types of data visualization um, that exist in the world, or at least in the books, um, when you're working with data and information. There is normally four types of data analysis which leads to data visualization and information design. Uh, so these types are temporal data. Temporal data is about time. Geospatial data is about locations. Topical data, about text. And network data, about people, who talks to who. OK, let's look at them in a little bit more detail. But before that, we had our uh, paradigm of data information knowledge. And as you could see, these four present themselves in the lower level from data to information. So if you already answer those four questions and perform those analysis, we have moved to the information level. And again, these are the questions that journalists are supposed to ask. So everything, it doesn't matter in which discipline you're talking about. As long as you're talking about analyzing the data, the language is really very, very similar. OK, let's look at temporal data. Temporal data talks about when and it looks into understanding the temporal distribution of one or more data sets to identify maybe growth rate, um, decay rates, uh, see patterns in time series data, such as bursts, for example. This is an example of a temporal data visualization, which, who remembers this? Who remembers the UK riots a few years ago? This was a timeline of UK riots uh, that The Guardian did. Un unfortunately, it is not very easily accessible anymore, so I can't show it to you online. But um, the whole idea was that, um, as you could roll over with your mouse, and you kind of would move in this timeline up and down, and you could see exactly when what happened during that, that riot, for example, and in which location. So it has a temporal aspect into it and also a geospatial aspect into it. For example, you could see that at 7 o'clock in this day, 10th of August, uh, 5 o'clock, sorry, a um, bunch of people were being arrested in different locations in Ireland. 
a lot of other people were look, arrested between 8 and 7 in Camden, in Croydon, and in other places. And this was one of the interesting events that happened, that a lot of people came together deciding to we should clean up the streets, for example. So as you move up and down on this uh, timeline, you could very, very clearly see what happened when and in which location. Another interesting example is the relationship status from the book, which is called London, the Information Capital. Uh, what the author or the data visualization guy, artist, did here uh, was to look into the relationship status of people and basically seeing how they are living. How many of married people are living on their own? How many of married people are living, um, um, I don't know, with, you can't, you can't really read this, no? Okay, I'm gonna talk about this one in, 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 in the bottom. So for example, between age of, this is I think just under 20, how many are single, how many are married? This is between 20 to 30, how many are married, how many are single, how many of, these people are cohabiting or living with their partners. Here it shows of single people, where do they live? Or of divorced people, in which area do they live at what stage of their life? So you could see that some specific areas in London, for example, or around London, a lot of divorced people are there. So if you want to go and find a match at a later stage in your life, maybe you should go and uh, live there. Or if you're young and want to find a lot of single people, maybe you go and live in the area that a lot of single people uh, are living. Again, this has three different types of um, data in it. It has temporal, it has topical, and it has geospatial data. This was a data visualization that we did for the marriage referendum um, in uh, Ireland. It was the uh, gay marriage referendum or same-sex marriage. Uh, and it was a timeline of what words and what keywords people were using on the social media when they were talking about a specific event. And when you look at it, how many of you are familiar with this event? Okay, no, nobody. Nobody cares about Ireland. Uh, this was the day of the referendum. So a lot of Irish people started flying home. It was so important for them that from all over the world, people were flying home to vote. And as you could see here, the day before the referendum, a lot of people are talking about tomorrow, they're talking about vote, but you are seeing the home to vote hashtag, for example, appearing. So if you just look at this data visualization, you'll get an idea of, even if you don't know what was going on at this uh, referendum, you'll get an idea of what happened. So the reason I'm showing these to you is, and a, a visualization like this is super, super simple to create. So you might think, how am I going to collect the tweets? How am I going to analyze the tweets? But there is a tool for that. Another example, this is a very nice timeline of Nelson Mandela's life. Again, it is temporal. I'm going to tell you what tool it is used. Actually, I'm gonna tell you now. Uh, it is a tool called um, Timeline.js. It is super easy. You just put your data in a spreadsheet. You give the link of that spreadsheet to Timeline.js website, and it creates it for you. You could choose your font and stuff, but even if you don't do it, it is still a really, really good looking timeline that you get. Okay, let's look at some geospatial data journalism work or data visualization. For geospatial, we're looking at location information to see the position and movement of people or whatever that was happening, tweets, for example, to see if we can find any pattern or any trend over geographical spaces. This is a famous example. Again, it is about lo uh, London riots. Um, so Simon Rogers and his colleagues had this idea that maybe the riots are happening, I'm sure a lot of other people were also thinking about that, but that's what they did. Maybe a lot of riots are happening in the poorer areas and they wanted to see if it is true. So what they did, they decided that, okay, you're going to plot the wealth on the, the locations in, in London. There's two data, one is the, uh, map data that you need to get from your statistics office normally. And then is the wealth or poverty index that again, data portals from each country normally provide them. So that was the kind of the, the, the base of the map, which is these red and green and blue colors. And red areas are the poorer areas, while green and blue colors are the richer areas. 
Then they plotted the location of riots. And as you can see, and as he, they could somehow prove, was that almost all riots happened in the poorer areas. Um, no riots were plotted here, necessarily. This is a map of transport in, in London. I'm not going to go into it, but it's different types of geospatial data, people who tr travel to London uh, for work. This is, again, you've already seen it, the, the football. This is another map, again, made in a very, very simple form. Uh, it is a map of uh, driving test pass rates, very simple, again, in Ireland. And just looking at this map, we get this idea that somehow people around Dublin are being failed. And what is the reason for it? it is, that, is it that because Dublin people are bad drivers and people in the, the country or smaller cities are better drivers? I live here, so I didn't need to pass a driving test in Ireland, but if I needed, I probably would have done quite well. But if I lived in Dublin, I probably would have had a difficult time maybe to pass my driving test. So what is the story behind it? I don't think it is that Dublin people drive badly. Maybe, maybe it's more strict. Anyway, I don't know. As a journalist, then you will go and look to see why is this happening. This is something that I really like, uh, geospatial data. Uh, how many of you have seen this? This is from The Guardian. How many of you live in London, maybe? One. I used to live in London, so that's maybe why I'm interested. Um, this is a map of... Um, your um, purchase, pa purchasing power in London. So what you could do is you put your salary and then it tells you in which parts of London you can actually live. Uh, starting with 26,000 pounds, a lot of people actually do get this salary. You get it in the UK, but forget about living in the UK actually because you can't live anywhere near London or, or in England. Let's go and put a relatively good salary and see what we can do. If you earn 50,000, still forget about London. No way you can buy a house or a flat or a tiny thing in London. Um, 100? Maybe. Still not in central London. So even if you have a, not really in most places in London, even if you have a good salary of 100,000, uh, you couldn't get a place in, in London. This is programming, is gone into it, so you won't be able to produce this with the tools that I, I, I'll introduce today, but if you're more interested in going and learning D3 maybe, you could produce that too. Okay, topical data. Topical data is about text. It's about analyzing the text to see what patterns we can find in a piece of text. The text could be a book, could be the whole archive of a library or the whole archive around a specific event. For example, in Ireland, we had the 1916 um, um, commemoration, one, 100 years after Ireland was a free state. Um, so you could go and look into all the archives, for example, or you could analyze the tweets as we did for the marriage referendum. All of them are text. Okay, let's look at some topical data here. This is the lost and found in Heathrow Airport. And I'm surprised with the things that people leave behind in the airport. Like, they leave a lot of alcohol, and it's duty free. I am assuming they didn't come to the airport with alcohol. But they leave toys, they leave mobile, a lot of mobile phones, glasses, jewelry, a lot of bags. Uh, they even leave their kids or their prams. They leave their shoes. I don't know how you can leave your shoes in the airport. But this is a data visualization of the things people leave. Again, the data is there. The airport has the data. You could take it and you could visualize it. You can either do it like this, or you can create a bar chart saying jewelry, <coughs> mobile phones, uh, cameras, etc. This is another data journalism work from The Guardian. Um, it is the cost of raising a baby in the UK. So if you're interested in raising a baby, maybe forget about that. It is very expensive. That's what I did after uh, seeing this data visualization. It's 218,000 pounds to bring up a baby in the UK. And most of this money is actually 
uh, spend on education. So if you really like to have a baby, maybe bring a baby, have a baby, but let's have him or her uh, not educated, then that's much, much easier to have an illiterate kid if you want to have it. Um, this is our example, um, is how happy people in uh, the UK are. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but if you're interested in it, go to the London Information Capital on their website, actually, and you could find. They have um, analyzed different aspects of happiness, how satisfied people are with their lives, how excited they are about the next day. And uh, you could see in, uh, like Kensington and Chelsea, for example, which is, a relative, which is a rich area, a lot of people are happy and satisfied and everything. But when you look at Westminster, which is still a rich area, but uh, a lot of people are probably involved in politics, they're all unhappy and unsatisfied. So it's not really about the money, it's probably about your job. And mo while most people in London are unhappy and unsatisfied, the rest of the UK people are so happy. So maybe don't live in London. Again, this is women's right. This is very similar to uh, the LGBT right. I'm not going to talk about it. This is, again, a very, very simple data visualization. It's a word cloud. Uh, it was kind of a little bit of a, a crowdsourcing project. What the Daily Edge did in Ireland said, explain Ireland in three words. Uh, use this hashtag, and then we see what people think of Ireland. And interestingly, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Ireland. Um, biggest thing was rain, which makes sense. Then broke. It is broke, then drink. drink. Crack, I don't know if you mean what it means, and grand. So again, in very, very simple visualization, you have a story. Another interesting one. I'm having too many examples here. How many of you are familiar with James Joyce's work? It is a very well-known Irish um, author, very respected. Um, there was an analysis of James Joyce's, Joyce's text in actually my uh, research institute. Uh, and one of the examples here was that they looked into the differences between woman and girl to see how James Joyce sees, because there's a lot of women and girl involved in his book, I believe, um, how he sees women and how he sees girls. And in most cases, women and girl are associated with similar things. For example, smell, you are, and he. However, women were associated with love and bad. So you could only love women in his book, and also only women were bad. Girls were not bad. So again, this is another story from a book. Let's look at networks. Networks is to identify highly connected entities and to answer the who question, to see who's talking to who. Networks could have two forms. It is either tree form or it is a kind of graph. It's closed form. This is a network of people who have collaborated, acad academ academics who have uh, written papers together in the world. Each paper who's got two authors from the different parts of the world, there's a link between them. And if we could see here pretty quickly that a lot of Europeans work with each other and uh, North Americans work with each other. They don't really work in between Europe and North America. And I think that's something that we should do. This is a map of a network of science to see which sciences are close together. It is an extremely ugly visualization, but it is a, a, um, an analysis of a lot of academic papers to see when you're talking about chemistry, you also talk about which other sciences. So you see that, for example, chemistry and maths and physics are relatively close to each other. It's a, not a very good visualization, I have to say. This is a visualization of the same marriage referendum in Ireland of the tweets between people and who talks between who. And if you kind of, a lot of tweets were going on, a lot of people were excited about it. But if you zoom into it, you see that people who were actually pro the referendum, pro marriage, um, uh, same sex marriage, they were kind of talking to each other. And people who were against it, they were talking to each other. So there was this big cluster of people who were pro and against, and they were mostly talking between each other. So when you do a network visualization, you could see clusters of people. Again, it's a very, very simple tool called Netlytic. If you're interested in social network data visualization, go and have a look at Netlytic. Not many people, especially in the journalism world, know about it because there are some guys who have nothing to do with journalism, some lab, some social media lab in Canada. 
uh, but they do really interesting work. This is an example of a tree, the budget that is spent between different departments in a country, same with here. Okay, let's move on to the tools. We have around 10 minutes to talk about tools. I'm going to just go over a number of tools, not a number, a lot of them, but in categories. This is a number of tools that you may want to take a picture of. Uh, my slides are all, I normally put my slides online too. But then I'm going to put them in categories because this doesn't make any sense, okay? Okay, so I'm going, Okay, I'm gonna move now. I am going to go through this process that we talked about and then we just see which tools we are going to use for each step. So, for your idea, you have to use your own tool. I don't have any tool for your idea. Finding and collecting the data. First of all, how do we find the data? Uh, there's a lot of places that you could find the data from centers of statistics office, open data portals, uh, you can contact the people, journalists normally are used to that. Pick up the phone, contact that specific organization that you can't find the data online. It is very likely that if you ask them nicely, probably, or not nicely, they'll send it to you. If they didn't send it to you, if you couldn't find it online, then you can ask for freedom of information. You can submit an FOI request. You could get the data with programming means. We don't want to do it here. Data scraping is one of the ways, and data scraping is when uh, the data is either in PDF or HTML format, but you cannot get it in Excel or CSV forums. And you could crowdsource the data. These are a list of data sources that as journalists you may want to look into when you're looking for data. Don't look at CSO, it's for Ireland. Uh, but the rest of them is for uh, Europe and for the world. Um, this is CSO you're not interested in it. Then there are data portals. Data portals are different from official data providers. They normally aggregate the data from different sources. A lot of countries now have their own data portals. For example, the UK has data.gov.uk. Ireland recently has started uh, data.gov.ie. And they, I think data.gov only is um, the US. New York Open Data Portal is, is a very good one. So go and find your own open data portal or look into some data providers, such as Google Public Data. Gapminder provides a lot of data. Uh, open Spending, Open Corporates, European Union Open Data Portal. They all are aggregators. They get their data from other places in most cases, but they aggregate the data for you in one place and makes it, make it much, much easier, and normally in more readable formats. If you don't know your open data portal, this is a map that maps all the open data portals in the world. So if you're interested in finding some data about Brazil, for example, go and click on Brazil and see uh, what open data portals you can find for Brazil or for South Africa. Okay, what tools for data collection? These are the number of tools. No way we can go into each of tools. Again, this is just an introduction for you to know what tools exist. And Google spreadsheets are very, very easy, but they don't normally work with pagination, and pagination means when your data is in a number of pages. You search for uh, all the houses in um, I don't know, Perugia, and maybe 1,000 houses are advertised. You need to go to the next page and the next page. Uh, that's pagination. Google spreadsheet doesn't do it. And if I want to make a suggestion, use import.io. It is super simple. They have a tool called Magic Tool, and it is magic. You just put your URL on it, so you search for the houses in per Perugia. It gives you this big URL on the top. You put your URL in import.io, and it extracts all the data for you. It goes to different pages, and you can export your data uh, as Excel or CSV. It's very easy to use, and for a, up to, I am not sure how much, but up to a lot of data, you can use it for free. If you want to extract data from PDF, we use these two tools. PDF tables and Tabula are uh, very good tools for extracting data from PDF files. These other ones are um, Google uh, or Chrome extensions that if you are interested in. There is a, a workshop later tomorrow, today or tomorrow on data scraping you, from School of Data. You may want to go to that. They are gonna uh, use one of the tools, I think. 
cleaning and fixing the data. Data is ugly. Open Refine is an excellent tool for cleaning the data and fixing your data. You can fix a lot of things using Open Refine, including typos in your data set. So if you have a data set that uh, data entry has been done with people, which normally is the case, uh, and you have, for example, USA with u.s.a, or USA, as just without any dots, it will be able to pick it up for you, and it will be able to fix it and consolidate it, all, all of the, the cases into one. It is also used for cleaning, reshaping, uh, annotating, and linking the data. So only one tool here. <clears throat> Analyzing and summarizing the data. These are the tools that you would be using. Excel is obvious. Google Spreadsheet is obvious. With Open Refine, you can do a little bit of analysis. For statistical analysis, SPSS is the kind of old guy there, which is expensive, and a lot of more people like programming kind of people, they say, ooh, SPSS, but it's actually a very good tool. Don't listen to them. They use R, which is also very good, and it's open source, and it's free, but it needs programming. So if you are not afraid of programming, use R, but otherwise, SPSS is paid. PSPP is like SPSS, but it's free. <coughs> so you can use PSPP for your data statistical analysis. Gephi, Node Excel, and Netlytic are for social network analysis. So if you want to analyze networks, use these guys. Node Excel is only for Windows. Gephi works on both. They both are quite complicated. Uh, you need to know about social networks. If you don't want to read or study anything about social networks, just use Netlytic. It's, it's a very, very great tool. Visualizing the data. We visualize for two reasons, to either explore the data or to tell our story and communicate our story. These are different types of charts that you have all seen here and there. And these are the tools that you could use for data visualization. Again, very, very quickly, some of them are for maps, for example, Car2DB. Uh, Google Charts is very simple and free. Plotly, simple and free. Netlytic, simple and free. Timeline.js, Google Spreadsheet, Silk. These are all free tools, except for some of them, at some point, you would need to pay. Data Wrapper is a very, very, very easy to use and good tool. Uh, Infogram, too. D3 is a guy who does the very, very fancy visualizations, but you need to do a little bit of JavaScript and programming. I suggest you check out this uh, URL. It tells you what sort of charts exist and what sorts of tools you could use for, uh, to, 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 to kind of come up with those charts. An example here. Oops. I have used bar chart here. It explains what bar chart is, when it is used, and then the tools that you could pick from here very, very quickly to go and work on your uh, bar chart. Look at Google uh, Charts Gallery, D3 Gallery, to just get ideas uh, about what sort of anal uh, data visualization exists, and uh, just for ideas. If you want to see some good journalism work, Go and have a look at the Data Journalism Award for 2015, 2016. The deadline is, I think, in two or three days. So if, you're, if you have done some data work that is ready or if you think you can do it in a couple of days, maybe you can make a submission. It might even be today. Um, but this is a list of shortlisted data journalism projects from last year. Also, Information is Beautiful Award. Um, they have shortlisted and selected a number of information visualization, which was submitted last year. As a resource, data journalism, data-driven journalism website is a great resource. Uh, you can find all sorts of information there. Uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about data journalism in what I basically talked in more details, the slides for my master's course are, are all online. So you can go and just check out and see what was the details of whatever that I was very, very quickly uh, talking about. The URL is not here. It's bahoret.net slash nuigddj15. I'm going to tweet the URL if you needed it. Uh, we have maybe one minute or two minutes for questions, if there are any burning questions. 
Okay? Thank you very much.